today's tech talk will be focused on serial to modern networks, understanding substation communications. As Colleen mentioned, my name is Mike Ramlachin. I'm a senior technical application engineer at GE Grid Solutions. My area of expertise is protection and controls. What we'll be going through today uh, for today's agenda is a brief introduction into networks and why do we need to learn about networks in our industry. We'll do a review of our legacy serial networks. We'll very briefly do that review. Then we'll go into what we really want to talk about, which is Ethernet networks that form the modern communication networks for us, whether it's substation, inter-substation, substation, substation, substation to control room, control house, or SCADA. We'll talk about various uh, topologies, the media and devices that are normally part of a Ethernet network. We'll touch a bit on the redundancy of some of these uh, Ethernet networks, and then we'll finish with an application example of going from a legacy system for time sync to using Ethernet networks for time sync. Why do we need to know about networks? And most importantly, what is a network? For substation engineers, protection engineers, power system engineers. Obviously, if you're an IT person, this is, this is going to be more of an introductory um, course for protection engineers. Uh, Substation engineers, power systems engineers, just to get a basic understanding of what networks are. But what do we need to know about networks? Why do we need to know about networks? The communications infrastructure of electric grid has been evolving rapidly in the last decade due to the need for transporting ever more sophisticated information, both data and control. More recently, Ethernet-based networks have been added to the pictures as modern relays need to communicate with control and dispatch centers and centralized management systems over local and wide area networks. When I talk about modern relays, I'm going to use the term modern relays, meters, sensors, and IEDs interchangeably. As we know, IEDs in our industry means electro uh, intelligent electronic devices, which cover a wide base of microprocessor-based devices, such as relays, sensors, meters, uh, data acquisition units. Notably, with the advent of IEC 61850 standards, this has encouraged relay vendors into speeding up the, the development of Ethernet as a preferred method of communication. The benefits of Ethernet networking are tenfold, and we'll go through a lot of those benefits today. Flexibility and easy deployment are only two of them. However, networking comes with features that protection engineers need to be aware of, and hence the need for going through an introductory presentation or technical seminar such as this. Because if we need to take advantage, full advantage of its capabilities, we need to know about it. It also comes with new challenges to protection engineers, such as network latency issues and availability issues that must be considered. Cybersecurity must be planned, the risk of cyber attacks evaluated and protection measures implemented. This tech talk explores the network architecture of modern protection control systems. It discusses aspects such as use and benefits of routing the needed solutions for maximum availability and real-time responses, as well as security measures that can be taken to reduce the risk of cyber attacks inherent when connecting over Ethernet. We'll also highlight some of the best practices when using Ethernet networking in the grid. What is a network? A network specifically, when we talk about networks, we're really referring to a computer network refers to connected computing devices, such as laptops, desktops, servers, smartphones, tablets, IEDs, etc., and an ever-expanding array of Internet of Things devices, such as cameras, locks, doorbells, refrigerators, thermostats, and various sensors, audio-visual systems for sending uh, audio and uh, visual communications, and these communicate with each other and share information. These devices use a common a common communication protocols over digital interconnections for the purpose of sharing resources or information located and provided by other network devices. In our industries, these are mostly the IEDs, sensors such as relays, smart meters, uh, smart sensors uh, for collecting data. The internet connection between these nodes are formed or linked together from a broad spectrum of telecommunication networking technologies. We'll go through some of those. Those are based on physically wired, optical, and radio and wireless radio frequency methods that can be varied based on the network topology. Just uh, briefly into a LAN versus a WAN. A LAN is lo local area network or LAN 
is when we talk about communication within a physical or logical location, for example, or a substation. So a substation would be a local area, and we refer to it as the LAN, a local area network. When we leave the substation, we talk about communicating to a wide area network, which is a WAN. And the wide area network might give us communication from our substation to another substation or a substation to a remote control center, et cetera. These networking topologies are how the network is arranged, including the physical, logical, and description how the network links and devices are set up in relation to each other. There are numerous ways a network can be arranged, all with the different various pros and cons, with some being more useful depending on the application. We will discuss in detail some of the more top typical topologies. Networking devices and nodes share information using standard or non-standard or proprietary protocols. These are the common rules, syntaxes, schematic, semantics, semantics, sorry, synchronization of communication and error recovery methods. Think of it as a common language the devices can use to understand the data exchange with each other. Examples in our industry include Modbus, DNP, and IEC 61850. Network architecture is the complete framework of an organization's network. The diagram of the network architecture provides a full picture of the established network with detailed view of all the resources accessible and available. It includes hardware components used for communication, cabling and device types, network layout and topologies, physical and wireless connections, implemented areas, and future plans. In addition, the software rules and protocols also constitute the network architecture. This architecture is usually designed by a network engineer, a network manager, or administration with coordination of engineers and other um, personnel, such as the protection engineer. Let's talk a little bit about legacy networks. When we talk about legacy networks, I'm specifically going to talk about serial. These networks still command a large install base, especially in the industrial sector. First, we had the hardwired method, which simply uses direct wired com connections for each signal or input output required. For example, a variable spe speed drive may have multi-core control cable run into it for, with a pair of wires for the start signal, another pair for the fault feedback, and a third pair for a 4 to 20 milliamp mortar speed signal. This is the simplest method, but typically involves a lot of extra cabling and insulation, and troubleshooting it becomes very, very difficult when something goes bad. For more complex applications, particularly where more data is required to be monitored and where a large amount of installation work is potentially required, serial communications, be Ethernet communications becomes, um, uh, serial communications become a better option to the hardwire method. In addition, safety should be considered. Hardwire signals are generally more foolproof for critical applications, as well as being almost instantaneous. Serial communications can be slower and prone to interference and dropouts if not configured or installed correctly. Many systems incorporate a mix of both, so your critical systems, um, signals and controls might be hardwired, whereas some of the non-critical or non-latency, uh, non-speed uh, required functions are used over serial. The physical media traditionally used for serial communication, we're probably uh, obviously all aware of, is the RS-232 or the rs 485 interfaces. The RS-485 has the advantage of being able to interface with many devices within certain limitations, whereas an RS-230 is usually a point-to-point, -point, device to device communication. Advantages of using serial including, we have a good understanding of serial. It's been around a while. Uh, we've used it a lot in our industry, so we understand it. It's widely available. We know how to configure it. It's very efficient, and it supports DNP and Modbus, which has traditionally been two protocols within our industry that have been popular within the industrial and utility market. The disadvantages include is the access to different protocols, speed, bandwidth limited, there's only a certain amount of data you could send and receive, and the protocol and services that it supports. It usually only supports a certain uh, one protocol or a certain sets of services. Our industry is evolving to RLR already has to, all, sorry, our industry is evolving to or already has evolved over to Ethernet networks because of the multitude of advantages it brings. From the earliest days of protection, relaying, design, and app, 
and design application engineers have continuously added new features in order to achieve faster, more reliable, more reliable and more selective protection. Similarly, the communication arc infrastructure used for telecoms information has been evolving for decades. First communications were established between transmission line terminals to create pilot wire or unit line protection. Then from point to point connections, the communication has evolved to system wide networks. More recently, though these networks were set up with fixed architectures, having every path through the network configured manually and never change unless a system has failed within it. Each connection would be designed to carry a predictable deterministic stream of data traffic. Examples of such networks are rings of fiber carrying sonnet or time division uh, multiplexing data frames. All these activities would lead to increased complexity of protection relays and communication requirements. The relay communication has evolved to Ethernet technology. You won't find a relay in the market today that does not have an Ethernet port on it. Um, when G first introduced Ethernet on relays, we were kind of laughed out to say, why do we need Ethernet communications in relays? But in today's world, if you'll be hard pressed to find the devices without an available Ethernet port on it. The so same thing in, when we talk about our cell phones, I remember, well, this is showing my age, but I remember back in the day when uh, cell phone was not as per, per, uh, usage was not as uh, wide used and we were able to deal without using cell phones. But today, can you imagine not having a cell phone and being able to have to work without a cell phone? So today's relays are complex embedded systems fully capable of communicating over large local area networks and um, over local area networks and even wide area networks to exchange information with SCADA systems, control and dispatch centers, and centralized management systems. IEC 6850 will require more and more data sharing in real time, which is a challenge by itself. The greatest benefit of using Ethernet in place of serial is an Ethernet network pad can carry a mix of traffic types at any time without rewiring or manual config reconfiguration. In a typical substation installation, the Ethernet network replaces bundles of dedicated control and communication wiring with a variety of data types, using the same network to call, carry out a large range of functions. DNP packets may be transmitted to a SCADA system. An HTTP application residing on a laptop may connect and display statistics from IEDs. A file server residing on a PC may communicate with IEDs using FTP protocol to gather the oscillography data. If at, at a later time an application that has communications and supports the protocol is installed, there is nothing to be changed. No more wiring, no more reconfiguration necessary. If the relay understands or, the, or ID understands the traffic, it will work. Any number of data traffic exchanges can be mixed on any network pack and all information go where it should without loss. As, lo as long as the overall bandwidth of each path is adequate to the largest volume of traffic that may pass through it. Each packet contains all information required on what that packet content is and where it is intended to go. Common mechanisms for access are available. For example, all the devices use the same Ethernet IP and hardware mechanism to perform this. Devices from different vendors can communicate with each other, so interoperability from different vendors. It is low cost, reduces device-to-device -device wiring compared to serial, offers robust, Redundancies, we'll talk about some of those redundancies. It's low latency and provides quality of service as well as supports different media types. Let's get familiar with the media types and devices typically found in a network, specifically in a substation network. There are three basic types of networking media. Most of us are familiar with the twisted pair copper commonly used RJ45 cable. There's a different categories of these types of RJ45 cables. The advantages, they're easy to terminate. Obviously, they're electrical uh, copper connections, uh, lower installation cost. Oh, the disadvantages, they can be susceptible to electrical noise. They're limited in the distance that they can go. 
but they can auto negotiate the speed so they can support 10 megabit, 100 megabit, 1 gigabit interface or various devices. The other tech, uh, media type is fiber optic, which has become very, very popular in our domain. It offers the advantages of being very immune to electrical noise, uh, not very, but immune to electrical noise. It can go very large distances depending on the fiber type. However, there is some skill required with installing, troubleshooting, and uh, working with fiber optic. And those include you need to know how to terminate it, you need uh, special equipment for that, you need special um, testing devices, you need uh, special devices to put splices in. So it, it can be a little, in terms of the skill needed, fiber optic has its needs. And then with the uh, the last media is uh, wireless. When we talk about wireless medias, most of us probably think about Wi-Fi. Well, Wi-Fi is calmer um, within the LAN wireless communication, for example, in our house. There is wireless technologies that exist that can be used at the WAN level, meaning going large distances, connecting remote areas together. And we're talking about distances of up to 20 miles. And there's various spectrums um, that we can use to supply with the wireless technology to be able to transmit that data, and we'll talk about some of those later on. Let's uh, talk about some of the networking devices. So a router is one networking device um, that we will see in our Ethernet network, and all of us are probably familiar with our, uh, routers because they're provided by our internet service provider, or ISP, such as uh, Verizon Fios, if you have, to give us access to the internet or give us access to a wide area network. It's a networking device that forwards data packets between computer networks, so from a local area network to another local area network that, are, that is separated, or from a lo one local area network via the WAN to another local area network. Routers perform the traffic directing functions on the internet. A data package is typically forwarded from one router to another through the network that constitutes interconnection until it reaches its destination node. So there might be multiple network uh, routers that the data spans before getting to its final destination. A gateway is an expansion of a router, and in this case, I show a gateway here communicating between our wide area network to give us access to our local area network, which contains our IDs, such as our relays and meters, and then our wide area network to get access to, for SCADA, systems for engineering access, for analysis of events. So a gateway is an expansion of a router. It provides compatibility between networks by converting transmission speeds, protocol codes, or, or having security measures built in. In the example above, the G500 gateway can be used to convert, for example, an IC61850 protocol used by the relays on the LAN level to a DMP protocol used by SCADA or the energy management system on a separate network available on the WAN. A switch is a device that connects, is a networking device that connects device, the devices on the network together in a computer network within the LAN by using packet switching to receive, process, and forward data to the destination de device. Unlike less advanced networking hubs, a network switch forwards data only to the devices that are meant to receive it, rather than broadcasting the same data out of all its ports. The exception is broadcast and multicast messages, such as goose messaging. Selection of the proper device are critical to effectively designing a substation network. We are familiar with the process of selecting rate relays or meters, which have to meet certain industry standards or operation in hardened industrial environments. Sorry. Some process, the same process should be assigned to the selection of switches, routers, and gateway devices. It's probably not a good idea to specify switches acquired from Best Buy or gotten off of Amazon or similar outlets or eBay. They should be compliant with the same requirements of the relays. So some of the selection criteria is, is it, is it hardened for the industrial environment? Does it have the number of ports that we need to connect to all our end devices? 
what type of port media do we need? Fiber optic, electrical, probably a mix of both. Will it be able to handle the, handle the bandwidth requirements? The two most typical bandwidth is the 100 megabit bandwidth and uh, 1 gig bandwidth in today's market. And whether the switch is managed or unmanaged. And we'll talk a little bit what we mean by managed and unmanaged. And of course, all devices should meet minimum cybersecurity requirements. These requirements might come from your IT department or even reliability councils. Generally, it would be recommended to be compliant with NERC SIP, these critical infrastructure protection. These type of requirements include complex password, role-based access control, encryption of the data, and being able to log all of the security events within the device. When designing an Ethernet network, the basic requirement is to select a topology. There is no one-size-fits-all topology. This will depend on architecture and application requirements. We'll, we'll discuss some of the more typical technologies, topologies used. The most simplest but least robust in that, of, uh, in that a single point of failure can cause loss of communication is the STAR Act architecture. So basically, with this architecture, all devices have a point-to-point -point connection to the switch, and the switch provides the interconnection, as we mentioned, from the devices to devices. The network, if there is a loss of one of those ports on the switch, then we probably will lose communication to that device. And if we lose the switch, then we lose the entire network. Generally, network recovery times when we do switching can be two to three, two, three to five milliseconds per Ethernet switch. We can have a redundant star architecture, and that's shown on the left, where we add two switches to the architecture. So if one switch goes down, we still have communication with the other switch. However, that adds complexity and cost to the architecture, to the topology. A more efficient topology to the redundant star network is a self-healing ring or the rapid spanning tree protocol standard. So in this standard, we connect our switches in a ring. Each switch will then determine its path around that ring. And if it sees a duplicate path, which it will, then it logically disconnects that duplicate path and so that it creates a single path around the ring. However, if, that's, if a path within the switch then is broken or a port on the switch goes down, what it will do will logically re -ena enable that path of the, of the ring that it disconnected so it, they can reestablish communication within the ring. Typically, this rerouting takes about three to five milliseconds. There are some more proprietary protocols out there that can do it faster, but then you won't have compatibility with different switches. We must also talk about interfacing our legacy devices within an Ethernet network. So if we do, for example, a Brownfield project and we do a retrofit, we create an Ethernet network and we install a number of Ethernet devices, we will probably still have a number of serial devices available. Not a problem. We can have a, some, a hybrid network where we can convert these serial signals into an Ethernet signal. And what we're going to use for that usually is a serial server. And these serial servers come uh, available in the market today. They come in various protocols for the various protocols. So like, for example, a DNP to a 61850 converter or a Modbus to DNP converter. And it converts the serial DNP to Ethernet IP DNP or serial Modbus to Ethernet Modbus. So we can have a, a good design using an Ethernet network while at the same time still having legacy support for our serial devices. So serial devices can exist within an Ethernet network. Most of what we've talked, this, most of the discussions today have been focused on substation communication within the substation, the local area network. There is need to expand the network beyond the substation 
for remote areas for applications such as SCADA, energy management, remedial action schemes, phase of measurement units, especially, et cetera. However, there will be limitations in the infrastructure we can install due to maybe budget constraint. The cost of running fiber from point A to point B is not economical, or the terrain might prevent us, so we might need to uh, go over river, over mountains, and we might not be able to run fiber in those areas. However, there is a way where we can, this is, this is where we can consider wireless as a viable, cost-effective, secure, and reliable option. It can span long distances and handle small to large bar, bar rates, uh, bandwidth, sorry. The microwave backhaul products can support data rates up to 750 megabits per second. So that's a quite a lot of bandwidth that we can get out of wireless. These technologies exist today and are supported by wild, by wide field installation and a variety of applications. So we have these technologies that, ex that are out there, examples uh, that are running and we can provide examples of those. If uh, you're looking at these type of technologies, uh, we can come up with an architecture for that that supports the need. Advantages of using, so you could use unlicensed or licensed channels for your wireless WAN wide area network. Advantages of using the privately licensed channels or LTE versus unlicensed or carrier-based LTE are not to have to worry about interference. You have more consistent conform performance. You're not going to be capacity constrained and, of course, security. If you can control all of the equipment and everything within the network, then you can control the security, the access within the network. When it is viable to install fiber to create a wide area network LAN to bridge various LANs or remote locations, SONET or SDH or MPLS is used. SONETs or SDH are synchronized optical networking standard protocols that transfer multiple types of data, data over a single fiber. Example, line differential. It is possible at low transmission speeds, such as a T1 level, to use an electrical interface, but the majority of applications use fiber for higher bandwidth requirements. This combining of the data is referred to as multiplexers or multiplexing. Hence, we sometimes refer to these devices as multiplexers. Think of a line differential or a teleprotection relay system. This data is critical, and there needs to be a guarantee on it getting to the destination with minimal latency and distortion. Sonnet or SDH provides this deterministic type of data transfer or synchronous data transfer. Because of this, users prefer this content, continuity, longevity, and continued product support and development around, around Sonnet. So Sonnet, um, there might be some confusion out there that Sonnet or SDH is giving way to MPLS. That might be true for certain applications, but Sonnet and SDH still has a space within our for applications within our environment. Speaking of, I'm sorry, my uh, slide didn't advance there. Sorry. Speaking of MPLS, as complexity of communication requirements grow, the trend is moving towards a circuit switch or point or point-to-point -point technology to Ethernet or packet-based technology. And MPLS provides this. Technologies such as substation automation, 61850, the Internet of Things, HD video, are drivers towards packet-based technologies. Even traditional technologies are also migrating towards packet-based technologies, such as SCADA and voice over IP. MPLS, or multi-protocol label switching, fills these requirements, and it is a mature technology. It's not something that we're new to the industry that we're introducing. Unlike SON and SDH, it's more of an asynchronous transfer mode, so data is transmitted as needed or on demand, so it makes the, the transmission of data more efficient. 
However, you don't have to choose one over the other. You can have better, best of both worlds with a hybrid system. You can have the Sonus SDH for low latency, control asymmetry, and connection-oriented determinism for critical applications such as line differential and protection. And you can have MPLs for its flexibility, reduced OPEX offered across a ver variety of service types and protocol types. All that with cybersecurity built in. We've talked about Ethernet being beneficial in that it supports multiple protocols and applications. With all of these different types of data, it is necessary to manage the flow to ensure an efficiently operating network. A VLAN or virtual LAN is a subnetwork which can be grouped together, a collection of devices on the same physical networks. VLANs make it easy for network administrator, administrators to partition or segregate a single switch network to match the functional and security requirements of their system without having to run new cables or make major changes in the current network infrastructure. VLANs are often used to set up by larger businesses to partition devices for better traffic management. So in this example, in the VLAN 10, if the engineering computers only need access to each other, there is no point giving them access to maybe the secure accounting computers. So we can segregate the traffic with these VLANs so that we segregate which devices they can talk with, with each other. So VLAN 10 cannot talk to devices in the VLAN 20. VLANs are also important because they can help improve the overall performance of a network by grouping together devices that communicate most frequently. VLANs also provide security on larger networks by allowing a higher degree of control over which devices have access to each other. VLANs tend to be flexible because they're based on logical connections rather than physical. Network devices such as switches need to support VLAN tagging. A managed switch is net necessary for this functionality. Not all data are created equal. There are certain data that are more critical than others. For example, a time-sensitive peer-to-peer goose message. And as such, must have priority over non-critical data. Typically in the switch, when data reaches a port and it needs to port, for example, from port one to port six, it ends up in a queue because port six might not have enough bandwidth to hire handle all the message at the same time, so it ends up in the queue. So message one gets sent, then message two, then message three, and then message four. With quality of service, it gives a message a priority. So for example, if a message where a high quality of service comes into port one, it gets bumped up into the queue on port six, where that message gets to the top of the queue and it's sent over non-critical messages. Is network, availability, is network availability important? And if so, how can we design a high available network? The level of availability of a network depends mostly on the applications that we run. For SCADA, administrative, automation, maybe, maybe not. For goose message, depending what that goose is doing, maybe or most likely. So if it's a protection goose message, then definitely. If it's a goose message just sending status back, then Probably not. For process bus, it's most definitely. Process bus is the sample value of analog data. So it's our CTs and PT signals that are transferred digitally from our substation yard to our control room. So that's definitely data that needs to be available for our protection devices to operate off. If a network element fails, what is the recovery time of the failed path? So that's when we're talking about network availability. If something fails in the network, how long do we have to wait for that recovery to happen and to have access to the data that we need to? So RSTP, we know, we know about the four, three to four millisecond recovery time, probably not good enough protection for protection class requirements. So one of the technologies that, we, that are, is available is the PRP or Parallel Redundancy Protocol. PRP uses two parallel and independent Ethernet networks or similar topology and operating in parallel. The data gets transmitted by 
sending a copy over both networks, and then the receiving devices receives a copy of two of the same Ethernet frame. It, it uses the first one it receives, and it discards the second. If there's a failure in one of the networks, there is no recovery time because that, that packet has also been sent on the other network. For example, if LAN A fails, it'll get a copy of the message from LAN B. So we usually refer to this bump loss recovery or no recovery time. However, for this method to be effective, the two LANs must be completely separate with no shared components, such as power supplies or switches which will constitute single points of failure. Also, the economics is it's going to be more expensive because we need to double the amount of devices in terms of the switches to create that network. The HSR, or High Availability Seamless Recovery, is a network protocol for Ethernet that provides seamless failover against failure of any network component. This redundancy is indivisible to the application. HSR nodes have two ports and act as a switch or bridge, which allows arranging them in a ring or a mesh structure without dedicated switches. It is in contrast to the companion PRP, which we talked about before. A source node sends the same frame over all ports to the neighboring nodes. The destination node should receive two identical frames with a certain time skew for the first frame to the application and discard the second, same as in PRP. In the faulted state, or if a path is broken, it will only receive a co one copy of the frame. A node forwards a frame unless it detects a frame that it has sent already or is already received. To reduce unicast traffic, a node does not forward a frame for which is the sole destination. This is an application example of using Ethernet network for a legacy type of application, in this case, time sync. Typically, in a legacy time sync, we use IRIC-B over coax cable to connect to all our networking devices. We have to wire that. We have to make all the connections. Um, we might have multi-drops of those connections, so going from panel to panel. The coax, we have to run that cable. But if we already have an Ethernet network, why run that additional cable? Why not use the Ethernet network? And there are certain protocols that take advantage of that, and one of them is a PTP, or Precision Time Protocol, the IEEE 1588. And for applications such as PMU, which need microsecond accuracy, it meets those requirements. So PMU applications, we could use PTP. There are other, app, other time, network time sync protocols like NTP and SNTP that we can use to time sync devices too, but they are not as accurate. They are as in a millisecond. So they might not be, <clears throat> they should not be used for time critical application requirements such as synchrophasers, process bus, and and various applications that might that need time sync for critical applications. So we've talked briefly um, and introduced you of all with all the devices that are available in an Ethernet network. What an Ethernet network is, you know how an Ethernet uh, network evolved from hardwiring and serial. Now, how to choose the right topology and architecture for your application. There's no one size fits all. Redundancy is a very important if you for high availability networks such as process bus, peer-to-peer -peer goose messaging. And you want to be able to accommodate expandability for the future and Ethernet architecture, Ethernet network allows for that pretty easily by just adding devices to your existing network. Availability of the devices and the technologies associated with Ethernet networks are widely available and widespread, and they're very cost-effective because they've been around for a very long time. And we don't have to completely, when we talk about going to an Ethernet network, we don't have to basically get rid of our SCADA, our legacy protocols such as uh, serial communication. We can, they can exist together with network. Um, Ethernet network technologies. And so we can have a phased 
migration. So we can have part our network or legacy, part Ethernet, and as we replace our legacy equipment, we can then add those legacy devices that we've replaced. We can replace them with Ethernet-based technologies and add those technologies to our Ethernet-based network. So one of the questions is, what is the difference between our goose and goose and regular goose. So our goose is routable goose, and a regular goose is obviously a non-routable goose. The goose messages are designed for peer-to-peer -peer substation communication, and because of that, it uses multicast, which is when a goose network gets to an Ethernet port, it is broadcast or multicast to all the ports on that switch. So it gets to all the devices within the network. And that's uh, by design so that it gives us a, a high probability that that message will get where it needs to get to and with the lowest latency. This peer-to-peer -peer architecture is a characteristic type for IC61 at 50 base systems mostly, but it can exist in non-IC61 at 50 base systems if an Ethernet network is available. That it describes the ability of arbitrary pairs of IDs connected in a substation network to manage the exchange of information as necessary with all devices having equal paths, in contrast to, for example, a client server or master slave communication. It is high speed communication, so there are within the standards to support like a protection class goose, you have to not only send the goose, you have to process the goose within certain times. So we're talking about in the milliseconds. So it's a very high-speed peer-to-peer communication. Applications include like break-of-failure break of initiate, uh, break-of-failure tripping, um, <clears throat> tripping out to um, maybe a controller in your yard that's going to trip the breaker. So these are all tr maybe tripping applications that time and speed is critical. However, because it's a multicast message, Goose messages are meant to only be multicast within the LAN, the local area network. Once it gets a router, remember a router is a device that bridges LANs or transmits data from one LAN to the other or from one LAN to the wide area network. Once a multicast message gets to the router, the router will not process that multicast message because why? Because the router needs to know where that data is going. With a multicast message, there is no destination. So the router doesn't know where that packet is going, and it will not send it, forward it. So that's where routable goose comes in. So routable goose is different from a normal goose in that it has a destination built in. So it knows where it wants to go, and it has that built into its Ethernet frame. When it gets to the router, the router sees that this is a, has a destination, and it forwards it to the appropriate destination. So applications might be like sending signals from your substation to another substation, for example, for teleprotection. You might want to send a goose message from substation A, a to substation B using your Ethernet wide area network, and you could use Routable Goose for that. It's also you can be used in remedial action schemes where you have a, some sort of sub, um, a wide area controller which then looks at all the PMU data over your entire grid, and it makes some decisions. And based on those decisions, it might want to trip certain pieces of equipment, and it could use Routable Goose to send that signal over a wide area network uh, across routers to get to its destination to be able to perform its functionality. Another question here is, apart from point-to-point -point connection, what topology is best for current differential schemes with GPS or without GPS? So this is um, a very a question where it's going to, I'm going to say it depends. Typically, in a line differential scheme, we use point-to-point -point connections. So um, substation A to substation B, we have a direct fiber, and we connect those fibers directly to the relay, and the relay does its protection by sending signals back and forth and does the line differential protection. However, we're losing a lot of bandwidth because for a protection class, for line protection, we probably only need about 64 kilobits uh, uh, bandwidth. Whereas we can use that fiber to have a lot more types of data on it 
and reuse the full capable reuse the full capability of that fiber. And that's where Sonnet, MPLS, and such comes in. In terms of the scheme, it all depends. The line differential can work over Sonic because, as I mentioned, it's very efficient and it's very deterministic. It can also, within the technologies built into MPLS, it can also work within MPLS, or it can have a hybrid of both MPLS and Sonic. And, and um, Adam, when I um, when Adam maybe answers a question, he can probably elaborate a little bit more on that. And in terms of for GPS, you only need GPS for line protection if there is a possibility of a symmetry in the communication. A symmetry meaning the send path and receive paths are unequal. So if I send the data and I receive the data, we usually use a ping pong method, calculate the total delay, we assume the send and receive paths are equal uh, by dividing by two to get the send and receive path. If they're not, if there's a possibility they're not equal or might not be equal, and that could happen during um, in a multiplex network, during switching, during um, recovery of paths, you might have brief instances where the transmit and receive pad is not equal. In that case, the only way we can correct for that is if we synchronize the relays of the two end time-wise together, and we can only do that with a common time sync and GPS being one of the technologies we use for that. So Steve, um, is there any questions you'd like to tackle? I'll hand it over to you. Uh, sure, thanks Mike. I see a couple questions related to the discussion on wireless network availability, redundancy, or security. Uh, I'll, I'll read one of these. Uh, states, wireless networks have suffered from availability issues such as outages and congestion. Does modern wireless address these concerns? This question points to a common concern we hear with wireless and critical infrastructure projects. Mike discussed a few options earlier, but I'll summarize um, just a few things here. Uh, first, uh, this concern of outages or even imposed performance limitations is seen more so with wireless networks that are sharing radio spectrum with other users. So this could be the case with uh, public carrier cellular or unlicensed technologies such as cell or uh, a Wi-Fi. Um, but there are wireless options uh, which are licensed for uh, your use only, or in other words, privately owned. And this can provide protection from these network availability issues um, that are more commonly seen in public networks. Uh, one example I've been seeing increase in popularity is uh, private LTE options where you own and control the network. Um, some examples of this, um, I'd say, that are more common to North America are CBRS 700 or 900 megahertz bands, or even FirstNet. Um, and second point I'd like to mention is some wireless devices are able uh, to offer redundancy features, uh, such as multiple wireless technologies in one box. Uh, this provides like a backup links with auto failover in the event one network goes down. Uh, one more common example uh, we see uh, is cellular as a backup to your core 400 megahertz license network. Uh, maybe one last point I'd like to mention regarding network availability uh, is um, modern wireless devices can provide the latest in cybersecurity and even electromagnetic pulse compliance uh, to protect networks from attacks, uh, which could potentially cause network outages. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Steve. And then I'll also hand it over to Adam to take some questions on the optical portion that he might see that's come up. Okay, thanks, Mike. My name is Adam Nichols. Good day, everybody. Uh, it's a couple of questions that sort of I could group together, I think. Uh, how do you transmit both serial and 61850 traffic in MPLS? Thanks for that question. Uh, along the same lines uh, from Rosalind, can you explain MPLS TP and how it supports legacy protocols? I think those two are, are very similar. So, so MPLS, um, as the name suggests, multi-protocol label switching. The multi-protocol piece allows for the transmission of, of many different protocols over the same common um, Ethernet or uh, network. Uh, MPLS requires some form of packetization 
to take a serial data stream and place it into an Ethernet frame. That comes with it um, some cost and complexities, cost in the form of, of higher latency as, as that particular serial data stream has to now be packetized and then go through the appropriate control mechanisms as it's passed up into an MPLS tunnel. But um, that, that's certainly one path and that's a common path are often reserved for less time critical applications. So we can take RS-232, 485, V.35 signals and um, reliably carry those over an Ethernet frame, which is carried over the MPLS um, infrastructure. A another technology and actually another question that, that popped up here, um, kind of what's the advantages of, of a hybrid optical transport a mode over MPLS? In, in hybrid, you, you really get the best of both worlds, as, as Mike suggested in the presentation. You can natively carry TDM traffic, serial time division multiplex traffic uh, in the same stream as the MPLS traffic. And, and with hybrid, you, d you don't have to go through a packetizer for the serial data. So, so think of a fiber optic really being split in half, where half of the, the traffic is, is carrying native serial data and, and non-burdened by the packetization, and then you've got Ethernet traffic that's either packetized uh, serial TDM or just you know native Ethernet. Uh, some some of the advantages of that is is really lower latency, uh, particularly at the edge router location. So think of a um, substation communication network where you've got a teleprotection connection coming in through you know a standard IEEE C thirty seven ninety four signal or a direct transfer trip uh, interface. Those particular signals, um, we do not need to packetize. We can place them straight up into and onto the fiber optic, and uh, we can do that in about 250 microseconds or quarter of a millisecond. And in contrast to you know, running the same signal through a packetizer, you're often, often adding, adding about a millisecond on egress and egress. Uh, so, so often the, the hybrid solution becomes three to four times more efficient. Um, the other aspect of, of hybrid and, and, ca and carrying some of these serial data streams is the improved symmetry. Um, Mike made a very good point here that, that we need to make sure that the ping pong communication between the two protection relays is, um, is equal because we are dividing it by two and uh, running serial teleprotection traffic that is time sensitive over a hybrid mode really improves the asymmetry um, you know, from about 200 microseconds down to less than 130 microseconds. So, so you really get a near perfect solution with hybrid. And then lastly, and I'll hand it back to you, Mike, is the zero touch traffic engineering. In, in the Ethernet network, we didn't talk too much about traffic engineering today, but there's committed and peak information rate bursts that need to be engineered. If you're running um, your teleprotection traffic over Ethernet, and, and this perhaps gets back to the, the the question also on uh, current differential schemes um, o over a multi-pointed solution, that, then we need to make sure that, that our traffic is engineered correctly. When you're carrying protection schemes over native Sonnet SDH uh, in its serial form, you don't need to worry about traffic engineering. So, so the hybrid solution that we offer is, um, is uh, you know, simpler to, to engineer because there isn't any traffic engineering. And uh, th that's in contrast to, to what you would have to go through to, to engineer the same solution over, over Ethernet. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Adam. And I just wanted to, you know, with Adam's point, um, why is asymmetry an issue for line protection? Because that causes a phase angle shift. Because if you're taking the measurement in time zero and you're taking the comparison measurement at time T zero minus one, then when you add those two signals vectorially, you're going to end up with a vectorial shift between them, and that could cause the relay to calculate differential where it's not there because of the asymmetry. And hence, if we're calculating the differential, then it could erroneously lead the relay to thinking there is a fault on the power system and to unnecessarily trip the equipment. So that's very important that that transmit-receive path uh, be symmetrical as much as possible. Uh, we'll, we'll take some more questions. Another question here comes in is, uh, this is again related, 
uh, related to rotable goose and standard goose, what's the latency difference? Obviously, standard goose, because it's within the substation where you control all of those uh, latencies within your switch, it's probably going to be faster within the substation. When you go outside the substation, we're talking about whatever technology you use in your wide area network, it will be susceptible to the latencies of those technologies. So there will be a difference between the two, and probably Routable Goose is going to be a higher uh, latency, and the Standard Goose is going to be a lower latency. Um, one last question we'll take, uh, we're running out of time, um, and it's uh, related to cybersecurity or C uh, CIP. So CIP has severely limited our use of Ethernet communication in CIP stations. Um, in our case, management decision to simply unplug Ethernet cables in all of our stations. Do you see Ethernet providing a security advantage or disadvantage over existing communication technologies considering the additional requirements for CIP regulation? And I would agree with this to a certain point where previously, yes, um, CIP basically said routable protocols, and I think it was more easier for utilities to say, hey, we don't want to deal with CIP. We don't want to deal with it. We'll just stick to serial because it's not covered under, it's not a routable protocol, so it's not covered. So it's kind of like a way out. Um, but, but it wasn't really addressing the issue of cybersecurity. So with all the new substandards, there's no way around it now. You have to address CIP requirements. And all so as manufacturers, we've realized that. So a lot of our devices, as Steve talked about, Adam talked about, come with certain level of security built into them where it's access-based control, encryptions, um, logging of events, security events. It's all comes built in that should be able to meet or will does meet all the CIP requirements. And also we do certain testing, so where we send it out to a third party and we have that third party basically try to hack into the device and to see how robust it, it is against intrusion and such. And we have we could have certificate certificate third party certificates for those things. So I think now uh, CIP is in front of us and we have to deal with it. We can't really do a cop out on it as we did when we kind of just said, hey, serial is not part of it, and we won't do it. Sorry, uh, Colleen, want to finish this off? Thanks, Mike, and thank you everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you again at our next Tech Talk. Until then, everyone please stay healthy and look after yourselves. This concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day.